Welcome to the Smart Grid Seminar. Uh, today we will have Shaban Power. Uh, we actually will be talking about EV charging, which is an interesting talk. I just want to remind everyone that the last presentation for this call is in two weeks. Any questions from Mac to talk about uh, the grid RP software? Our speaker, Shaban, is a graduating PhD student in mechanical engineering. She's actually graduating in a month, and she'll be doing postdoc at the PH. So, uh, congratulations. Thank you. And her uh, advisor is Professor Ram Rajagopal, and uh, she'll talk about electric vehicle charging today. Thank you for the introduction, and also for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I've been to this seminar many times over the last six years, although usually in a different room, apparently. Um, and it's really cool to have the chance to present and come talk to you today a little bit about my research. So the topic of my talk will be long-term planning for EV charging, uh, large-scale modeling of control and driver behavior. Um, but I'll start with a little bit of background. So you're all very familiar with the, trans the transformation going on in the grid and in energy, but transportation is also undergoing a similar change. And the two sectors together account for a large portion of direct emissions. This snapshot from 2019, you can see transportation and electricity together are more than 50% of direct emissions in the US. Many plans that look at getting to net zero, for example, this global pathway I borrowed from the IEA, you can see those two wedges start up very big and very quickly disappear. And that's through policies like ban on the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles, targets for sales of electric vehicles, on the grid side, renewable portfolio standards, uh, bans on you know, building new coal plants, different policies making this happen. And really what's unprecedented is that these two transformations are coupled together. Electric vehicle charging couples transportation and the grid. And this leads to many interesting opportunities and also challenges that we have to overcome. So the two impact each other in this coupling. It goes in both directions. Uh, on the left, I have this little sketch of the grid where I put some loads and generation, some storage, the network itself. Uh, on the right, I actually took this snapshot of the Marguerite system on campus because a lot of those buses are electric and we've done a couple of projects looking at their charging patterns. And so the grid impacts transportation in several ways, you have to have enough charging stations. Many researchers, many researchers have found that if you don't have convenient, accessible, inexpensive charging options, people will just won't switch to EVs. So that's important. It provides the electricity and the stations. Uh, reliability becomes more and more important if you depend on the grid for your transportation needs. Uh, lower electricity prices can actually help encourage adoption by making EVs more uh, like economically better than internal combustion engine vehicles sooner. Actually, this is happening a bit faster than expected with the increase in gas prices lately. Um, and then the, the impact goes the other way too. So for example, charging when it's uncontrolled can cause early aging of equipment in the grid. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, it can force capacity upgrades. So if you imagine like a residential neighborhood, maybe 10 homes are supporting supported by one transformer. If each home has a typical peak of two or three kilowatts and suddenly you're adding a bunch of EV chargers at seven kilowatts each, you can imagine how it quickly overloads what the system was built for and it can cause really expensive upgrades. Um, they can also change the generation resource mix. So depending on when EVs are charged, it could call for more gas peaker plants or it could be covered by more solar. Um, and then the benefit, they can also be benefits, so they can provide grid services. We won't get to talk about all of these today, but improving this coupling was the focus of my dissertation. Um, and we'll look at a few of these different aspects. Before we get into the details, we can talk about sort of what's at stake and what questions are we asking here. So I like to break the problem down into planning and operation. And in planning, we're talking to utilities like PG&E, policymakers like the California Energy Commission, grid operators in Palo Alto, and they're asking 
you know, where do they need to put new stations? When do they need to install them? Do they need to upgrade their equipment? Do they have enough generation capacity? And the timelines for making these decisions are quite short. If we look at California in particular, state agencies are targeting 8 million personal passenger electric vehicles in the state by 2030. So that's a really big increase. But all of these decisions have a pretty long time horizon. So if you want to install like a bank of new fast chargers, that takes several months to a year, at least. If you want to build a new substation, that takes longer. Building a new power plant takes several years at least. So we have to look at what's happening in 2030 and plan ahead so that we can make these decisions actually very soon. Um, operation is sort of the other side of the problem because once you've made these decisions and you have your set of equipment, people have adopted EVs, you have a certain grid configuration, then how should you operate and manage that day to day in the best way? So we'll talk about both of these a little, but planning first. Quick question. Yes. Have the grid operators look at the battery technology? Yeah, they're looking at batteries that's, that's and key, everything. Uh, instead of charging in two hours, you can finish charging in let's say 10 minutes to reduce the then the, the capability required for that time is really huge. Yeah, I think fast charging is really interesting because from the sort of personal perspective, people think, oh, I'd rather just charge quickly, but I think it will actually be really expensive to put enough storage to really buffer such high mm -hmm. charging loads. So it's definitely something that people are looking at. But, but it depends on the battery technology. If you can build battery technology. And work with the farm target. Yeah, well, it, but they might be really expensive. It might be, yeah. We'll, we'll see, yeah. yeah, so there's. The cost, of course, is the uh, income. Yeah, exactly. And so I only really look at, I guess, the charging side, but there's a whole area of research looking at the behavior and sort of what are people willing to pay to charge faster and sort of how do they value these different options from an economic point of view? Because you could make charging faster, but it's not good for the battery health, it's not good for the grid, it's expensive if you have to add batteries there to buffer it. So I haven't looked at that myself, but it's I know it's a big question, sort of what is where where does people's what's what's worth it, you know, to have that's extra people in your change the equations. That we can change, you know, how many stations you need. Yeah. And where they have where really you need them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, lots of really interesting questions in here. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So before we get into, I guess, these planning scenarios, I want to break down electric vehicle charging behavior, because I'll talk about that a lot. Um, so one thing you need to remember is that mobility needs themselves are very heterogeneous. Everyone has a different pattern. If you think about yourself or your housemates or your parents at home or anyone, you can imagine they have a different how did they get here today? What did they do this morning already? This imaginary person I drew over here, you know, they left home, they dropped the kid off at school, they went to the office, they picked them up, they ran an errand, they went home. Then what makes this problem really challenging is that on top of that, you have preferences around charging options. So this person might have waited until they got home and then plugged in once at the end of the day. Maybe they also topped up at work because it was free and they could. Maybe they didn't have those options and they waited and they used the fast charger on their way home. Maybe they didn't charge at all because most drivers don't charge every day. Um, so you sort of layer these different mobility behaviors and then charging behaviors. And when you multiply that by you know, 8 million drivers that we're looking at for 2030, you'll end up with this aggregate load profile. You'll see a lot of figures that look like this in my talk. Um, but I want you to remember that it's made up of all of these individual decisions and individual sort of charging sessions. Uh, the way you read this plot, um, you can say, for example, at 9 p.m. there's about two gigawatts in this scenario of home charging, and at 9 a.m. there's about two gigawatts of workplace charging. But really, you have to remember this comes from individual small charging sessions. And so that demand has an impact on the grid. We've talked about it just a little bit about you know, fast charging and buffering that impact. But even before you get to adding batteries, you can do a lot with charging itself because fortunately it's a very flexible load. Um, I mentioned most drivers don't charge every day, 
And a lot of sessions have idle time. So if you imagine someone arrives at work, they plug in at 9 a.m. and they need to charge for two hours, but then they just sit there connected for the rest of the day. So that's an opportunity in the sort of form of flexibility. So I guess the three main types of flexibility to break it down for you, we have within session shifting, this is the most traditional form of control. Um, it's very inexpensive to implement because it's done through a timer, maybe in the driver's app or in the charging station. Um, and that's exactly this case. You know, you arrive at work at eight, maybe you don't start charging until 10. Or you arrive at home in the evening at dinner time, but you have a timer set until midnight because it's cheaper to charge later. <coughs> Um, another type of control and flexibility is load modulation. So the same idea, you know, if this person arrived at eight, they needed to charge for a couple hours, but they don't have to charge sort of all or nothing. And you can change how quickly they receive their energy throughout the day and reshape their demand in any shape we want, so long as they receive the same amount of energy in the end. Um, and the final type, these two types of flexibility are both done within a session. So once someone's already arrived and decided, I'm going to try to work today. But you can also think about changing that decision itself. Um, maybe it's less expensive to charge at work. Maybe it's more convenient to charge at home. All of these different factors influence that decision. And several studies have looked at things like changing those prices or giving behavioral nudges. They know, you know, wait until tomorrow. It will be better for the grid these kind of nudges to change that decision itself. And you can imagine that really changes when someone's charging and then their total impact on the grid. The other, I guess, so we'll talk a lot about these two types of control today. Um, and in a paper we're working on now, we look in much more detail at this third type, changing charging infrastructure. So if you have you know, more workplace and public charging built out, more people have the option to charge during the day and some more of the load happens during the day. Um, yeah, very interesting type of control. And so how do we sort of use these types of control? If you were a policymaker, you'd have several different tools. Um, most commonly it's setting rate schedules and electricity prices. So this rate is actually one from PG&E for residential EV uh, charging. And you can see it's most expensive to charge at home between 2 and 9 p.m. with this rate schedule, and it's least expensive after 11 p.m. So in the charging data we have for PG&E area, we actually see about 30% of the drivers doing home charging set timers. And so at 11 p.m., there's a big spike from everyone who just delayed their charging until that lower price period. Um, shaping charging infrastructure, using behavioral nudges, these are all tools for uh, policymakers to use these types of flexibilities. Yes. Do, do these people have automatic timers like built into the charging and they just, is it like just charge here or is it just a button you press that says optimal charge? I think it varies by car, like manufacturer and by charging station, but it's very simple. You don't have to make the decision every day. It's sort of like if you have a home charger, you could put a setting on it that says, you know, never start before 11. Yeah, so it's automated. I think that that's one of the challenges that utilities design these rates as a way of shifting behavior and say, oh, everyone's going to wait and do their laundry at night. But when you have these automated responses, it's like very precise. And so you get a very sharp sort of spike at 11 p.m. instead of just sort of gradually shifting the load. So it's not like a smart integrated thing where it's actually looking at the price. No, it's I think it's the, saying it's normally cheapest at 11. Yeah, but I think the driver gets to pick a time. Okay. So in our data, we see people have picked like 9, 10, 11, midnight, 1 a.m. Sort of most people pick on the hour, even though the only rates in this area are at 11 and midnight. So the people who pick 9 or 10 p.m. are just thinking, oh, later is better. So it's not tied to the utility or officially tied to the pricing. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Uh, so because we have like load shifted and it is like automated response, do you think it can affect the market? So for for example, so at 11 p.m. We, we see like peak and because it's like many different types of charges getting power. So it means like we are putting some pressure on the demand and hence like the price will change and it will increase. Is there a possibility of that? I think that that well, you do see, start to see a big 
team. Right now, it's still pretty small. Um, but the, the drivers aren't paying the market rate for electricity, right? These rate schedules are set you know, years in advance. Right. So for, exa uh, for example, this rate, it goes through this long process with the CPUC to get this rate put in place, and then it stays for a couple of years until you know the next rate comes through that process. So I think actually how people respond to this, it would change the market for you know the people who are selling electricity and the price, but they don't actually pay any different because of this behavior. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 No. Okay, so this is the introduction. So we'll get into some of the details now, but. I wanted to set this up the sort of two foundational research questions that we tried to address are what shapes charging demand, understanding driver behavior and how people are making those decisions, and then how should we reshape it to improve grid impact. We'll talk about that a little today in terms of you know how to how does control work at reshaping charging. Um, and then the grid impact piece is I won't have time to go into that today, but we'll have a paper coming out on it very soon. And the last piece of motivation I wanted to include is that a lot of modeling in this space is proprietary. There are a lot of consulting companies that do this type of work and building these forecasts um, very heavily based on modeler assumptions and often very expensive to run. So the other piece of motivation for this work, other than the problem, is also sort of methodological of building these open source data-driven tools that we can then share and publish so people can use them. So, this is the outline of the talk. We'll look at shaping charging demand for driver behavior, and then we'll also look at control. Um, and starting with driver behavior, this is the paper we wrote about it. If you want to see you know, all the details of it, and I'm happy to talk more about it later too. So understanding driver behavior, we started by looking at charging data. Uh, we had access to a very large data set of charging data. And noticed a lot of heterogeneity, a lot of people with different charging patterns, how frequently they like to charge, what type of charging they like to do. We use this data set uh, through collaboration with ChargePoint that's all from the Bay Area, um, most of it in Santa Clara County, which is where we are now, uh, a lot of workplace charging, but still, you know, several hundred thousand sessions of public charging and residential charging. Uh, focusing on 2019, it was about 4 million sessions from 38,000 drivers that were regularly using the charging in this network. And, oh, sorry. and so studying this data, we observed a lot of different behaviors. We did observe some patterns, some people who always like to charge at home or some people who have you know, certain behavior showing up again and again. And so we decided to cluster the drivers. We used agglomerative clustering as a type of hierarchical clustering and described each driver with a feature vector that included sort of aggregate characteristics to describe their behavior. So their battery capacity, because we found that impacted their behavior. And then for workplace or home charging or public charging, you know, how frequently do they do that? When they do that, how much energy do they use? When do they start charging in each of those segments? All these different behavior pieces. So we create a feature vector for each driver, normalize, and apply the clustering. And this dendrogram is an interesting way of visualizing the results. So agglomerative clustering actually goes from the bottom up, but you can read this from the top down. And so if you start at the top over here, you imagine all 38,000 drivers together. And then they split off into these two branches. We have this branch with several clusters that really only use workplace charging. And then we have a branch that breaks off over here with lots of drivers that use residential charging. And then drivers that mix public and workplace charging, some with large batteries, and that changes their behavior, some sort of lower typical energy, different times of day that they like to charge, different mixing of these segments. And we clustered the drivers into these 16 different groups. And then we wanted to use this insight about these different charging patterns to build a model of future charging demand. So remember, this is current charging, and these are you know, 2019 drivers. When we looked at the literature, how people are doing this, a lot of models are travel survey based. So they'll take a travel survey, which has very detailed information about you know, this person left at 8 AM, and they went to work, and it was this far, and then they got there, and then they left at you know, noon, and then this far. But that involves a lot of 
decision making for the modeler, you have to model. Remember, we had mobility patterns, but then on top of that, preferences around charging. And so you have to model how these drivers would have made charging decisions if they had EV. This is challenging. Um, it's good because it can be very detailed, and you have this data for a lot of places, but it's also expensive. And so we wanted to use this analysis of charging data and bring it to long term planning. So we developed a model uh, called Speech, which stands for Scalable Probabilistic Estimates of EV Charging. You can look at it. The code is published, and you can read the paper about it and play with it yourself. I'll show a demo of how you can do that later. Um, the key design features for this model were scalability. We wanted it to run quickly so that you can study different scenarios because you know you might change your mind and disagree and want to test assumptions and run sensitivities, and you don't want to wait days to find out the result of each change. Um, it's open source, and then we built in these behavioral knobs that I'll talk about. This is the graphical model, and so we have these driver groups that we identify through clustering. And then how it works is for each driver group. So conditioned on being in group one, you have a certain probability of charging and deciding to charge at home today. And then conditioned on being in group one and having decided to charge at home, you have a probability, a distribution of your likely start time and energy use for that session and duration of that session. And so with the distribution over the different driver groups, you can sort of use this to build up an aggregate load profile. We can take another sort of closer look at the different driver groups. So these are the same 16 clusters we saw before. Uh, and this is just a normalized load profile for drivers in each group. So you can see we have those three clusters that were on the left that are people who use workplace charging almost exclusively. But they have different sort of arrival time patterns. You know, cluster three uses much more energy than cluster one overall, if you just sort of imagine the integral of this profile. Then we have some groups that use a lot of home charging. You can actually see here, each of them has these, this timer behavior and this spike at 11 p.m. showing up. Then we have a bunch of groups with public charging and multi-unit dwelling charging and workplace charging. I think some of the really interesting things when we did this analysis, first was the mixed use of different charging segments. So a lot of models will assume, you know, this is a home charging person or this person prefers to charge at work. And we found a lot of drivers mix and use many different options. Um, we saw different behaviors like topping up, you know, people who never go below 80 and they're always charging every other day and charging small amounts of energy to maintain a high state of charge, whereas other drivers would go several days and then have a big charging session. Um, so it's sort of tied to risk aversion. Uh, the timers, it was very interesting. And I want to draw your attention to these values here. So this is the weights in the original data set. In the original data, 16% of the drivers were in cluster one and 2% were in cluster four, for example. But changing those weights is how we can build new scenarios. And so we'll look at how to do that. This is the original distribution over those driver groups. So I mentioned you know 16% in cluster one and 2% in cluster four. But changing that distribution is a really valuable tool to create new scenarios. Oh, yes, the other piece of the model first is this charging session model. So I mentioned given, you know, given being in group one and given that you're charging at home, what's your likely session parameters? Um, and so we modeled that using another type of clustering called Gaussian mixture models, uh, the joint distribution of energy, start time, and duration. And what you can do with that is sort of understand breaking down this aggregate, all of the drivers in this particular group when they charge at work, this is their charging profile. But you break that down into the different mixture components and you can interpret them as different behaviors. So I think, yeah, so 20% of the time, you know, 20% of the sessions here came from this first mixture. And so you can say 20% of the time when a driver in this group is charging at work, their session looks like this and they're charging, you know, in the afternoon. Or 15% of the time, their session looks like this and they're charging in the morning. Sort of interpret these mixture components as behaviors as well, breaking down the data further. This is the base load profile. So you can see there is a lot of workplace charging uh, in the data set. And you can see a little bit of phone charging. You see that 11 p.m. spike, but a lot of workplace charging. And so that's not really what we expect 
even for today, what's happening, but also for 2030. And so to start building these different scenarios, we started by changing that distribution so that there's more home charging to match sort of what we expect and what's happening today. So here's a base case. And here we said, okay, well, let's reweight those different driver groups so that two thirds of people are in groups that use home charging or have access to home charging, because that's more similar to what we expect in 2030. And this has actually the baseline. We see 30% of the drivers who are charging at home using timers. But we can change that. We have those timers are isolated as components of the mixture model. So working with the California Energy Commission in their modeling of 2030, they think that more people will use timers and sort of adopt this time of use behavior. And so they said we should increase that. And so here's what happens if two thirds of people who charge at home use timers. You can see the peak is much higher. <laughs> Just the simple change of more people you know, following their time of use rate increases peak demand by a few gigawatts, which is really significant. But then we can play with this further. So let's look at, for example, those timers. If you look at the mixture model for this segment, you can see that the first mixture component was this, you know, typical uncontrolled home charging, you arrive and you're charging in the evening. And the second component was this timer behavior. It starts at 11 p.m. And so if we change the distribution over those behaviors, we say actually this behavior is, you know, zero of the sessions following this behavior, and then we'll shift all those to this other one. We can create an uncontrolled version of the data that we started with, sort of identifying that behavior and taking it out. So this is what the uncontrolled case would look like if you didn't have timers and didn't have time of use rate. We can play with workplace charging. So this was one of those groups. What if we said no one charges in the morning and more people charge in the afternoon and we're going to shift that and you know maybe workplaces are encouraging people to wait and plug in after lunch, something like that. And you can see how that changes the shape here. So we've reduced the peak in our workplace profile and sort of increased the afternoon amount of workplace charging. You can also play with the oh, can also play with the driver group distribution. So we had this base case we started with, with a lot of home charging. You could increase that or increase, in this case, multi-unit dwelling charging. So say, okay, today it's very hard for people in apartment buildings to have home charging installed because there's challenges if they're renting and it's, it's, who's going to pay for it. It's also very difficult to site. It's a much more expensive project, but maybe in the future that will be resolved. And so in 2030, we can look at a scenario where we have much more charging at multi-unit dwellings and you can see then what happens. In that case, that segment grows. Um, the peak is a little bit higher in the evening. You could say, actually, you know, home charging is not, it's gonna be a thing of the past and we'll have more workplace charging and switch more drivers to those groups. Or you could say, everyone's gonna have large battery capacity and switch everyone to the groups with large batteries. Basically, you can do anything you want when you're designing these scenarios for 2030. And I, what I think is really important is that I don't know how to make those decisions uh, for each place, for each planner. So we published the code, published the model. And if you go and download it, you can actually locally run this tool. Um, this is me playing around with it yesterday. And you can go change those assumptions yourself. You can say, I think you know, I'm going to change the number of drivers and run a weekend model, or I'm going to, what did I do next? Take out the timers. You can see what happens. You can look at different scenarios. Uh, you know, some of the ones from the paper, like that high multi-unit dwelling case, see what that does to the load profile. And so you can go and play with this. You can do custom cases where you actually go and assign you know, different weights to the different driver groups. And so we've been working with utilities like PG&E to help integrate this into some of their planning and provide more low shapes and more behavior patterns for them to use. But really they know best about what's likely to happen in their area. And so that's why we wanted to publish this tool and um, encourage everyone to use it. Yeah. Um, has cross charging been factored into this? Uh, so we have fast charging. We have a pretty small amount of fast charging data because it's from ChargePoint. So if you're 
if you're interested in fast charging, you can use like sort of increase the weight of the groups that use fast charging. And there's one in particular, I think I get to actually at the end of this playing around. Uh, yeah, so this group in particular has a lot of fast charging. And so if you focus on that group, then you do start to see it in the profile. That's all this sort of spiky behavior here. I don't know. Um, so it is included. And I think also if you ran this model on data that had more fast charging, you would be able to break that down further and see more sort of behaviors even within that group of people that use fast charging. Um, but interestingly, we actually find the distribution of start times is very similar to other public charging, the public slow charging. And so when you aggregate and you say, okay, here's my scenario with 8 million people. What if all these people using slow public charging use fast public charging? The actual like aggregate load shape is very similar. Um, so I guess it depends what you're studying. If you're studying the distribution level, it's very important to know whether it's fast or slow. But if you're studying sort of from a very large scale like generation planning, then they kind of look the same. It's interesting. But it's interesting that they look the same because I mean, with fast charging, you're almost like tripling the amount of power. Well, actually, maybe I'm sure quite a lot more than tripling the amount of power that you draw for that charge, but it ends up all distributing the same. Yeah, it keeps over like the same time or like different because they might be kind of like shrink that like from like a little curve that goes up in five hours to like three hours. Yeah, it is each session looks quite different and they're much shorter, like you said. But people arrive at the same sort of in the same distribution at fast or slow public chargers. And so when you're at the scale of millions of people, you can't see that difference very much. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um but you're right, at like an individual level, it is very different. It's just because, I mean, maybe in the future also, you'd have more fast chargers at workplaces or other locations, and you'd then get different patterns. But right now, fast chargers, at least in this data set, are mostly located at places where slow chargers are, like at grocery stores or places. And so it seems that they have the same arrival time distribution, and then you end up with the same aggregate load shape. Yeah. Um, I think, oh, don't go oh yeah, so that's the last slide about this model. Um, one of the interesting future works about this model is applying it to other places, applying it to other data sets with more fast charging, for example. Um, and so if this is something you're interested in, you know, I'm graduating, but <laughs> there's a lot of work to be done. And I know there's a lot of interest in continuing this. Uh, yeah, so we are continuing this work and uh, a lot of interesting directions we are pushing towards. I hope you can mention a little bit in the end. Yeah, I will. Then if any of you, you know, especially your graduate student, are interested in this area, just, just let me know. Yeah. Um, okay, how am I doing? Oh, that's pretty slow. Okay, well, so we'll have a little bit of time to talk about control. That's the other part of this modeling. Um, one of the types of control we talked about was that shifting within a session. Um, and these timers are an example of that. So this is just in the charging data that we have from 2019. About 30% of people are using timers, and that's what this looks like is the spike. But the other place that we looked at, we looked into doing control is in workplace. Um, this is a really sort of growing area of interest. We worked in a project collaborating with Google to do some control at their workplace site, also at Slack. We installed a bunch of new chargers and they're doing control. Um, it's a really nice application because there's a natural aggregator. If you're thinking about people charging at home, it's very distributed and some people decide to set a timer, they do whatever they want. But at a workplace, you have this natural aggregator who can manage it and sort of controls the site. Um, and it, so they do this load modulation control and it's typically done to minimize the overall bill. Um, one thing that this impacts at a workplace site, usually the charges are all supported by one transformer. And so we looked into how the charging impacts the lifetime of that transformer with different rate schedules and different charging patterns. So we'll go through that really quickly. Um, so transformers have been studied a lot in the context of residential charging. You can see people arrive at home and there's a big evening peak that causes overloading very quickly. Several demonstration projects have confirmed this. 
but we really wanted to look at workplace charging and how this impacts the transformer at a workplace or a commercial site. Um, the aging of a transformer is driven by the highest temperature that's reached in its insulation. Um, and so this is a model. This is kind of interesting. On the right, if this is the total load of the site in yellow, you can see that the temperature on a different scale, but the temperature kind of lags that. And so it's really driven by that loading, but there is some thermal inertia. Um, and so we basically modeled a particular transformer at a Google site through that collaboration and said, okay, we have charging demand. What if we change that? How does that change the temperature? And then the temperature, the lifetime is a function of the temperature and it's an exponential function. So after some point when you're going above, I guess the rated temperature it was designed for, you very quickly see the lifetime drop off. Um, to formalize this a little bit, what we're talking about is the total demand at the site. So all the cars charging there added together. We can call that D, demand. And then what you're doing is minimizing some function of that demand, subject to simple constraints like delivering the right amount of energy, uh, only charging when the vehicles are there. Uh, we don't look at vehicles to grid, so only charging between you know, zero and, in this case, 6.6 .6 kilowatts because it was all level two charging. Um, and then this function can be anything you want. But in this case, it's most commonly done to minimize the electricity bill. And we also looked at what if you explicitly minimize the transformer's aging. This is an example profile. So in blue, this is the uncontrolled profile for the site. If there were 355 cars charging together. And you can see it's sort of this uncontrolled peak is highest around 10 a.m. And then it drops off as fewer people are charging, mostly because most people arrive at this time and they don't have very long sessions, but also because fewer and fewer people arrive later. Um, if you do the control, if you say, okay, this function is PG&E's E19 rate schedule, which is a rate schedule for commercial sites that includes the demand charge, which is what uh, penalizes the maximum rate reached at the site, then they end up doing this load, like peak minimization. You see the green result is flat. It's as flat as it can be, subject to those constraints around people leaving and getting the right amount of energy. Um, if you do the transformer aging, as the objective function, it's quite similar, but it allows these kind of little peaks at the beginning and end. And that's because of that thermal inertia. So you can overload it more for a little bit, but just not long enough that it really heats up. And then it's whatever level you're sustained at for a long time that drives the hottest temperature that it reaches. So very similar. And so we found a really interesting result. And so how to read this plot, on the bottom, we have the number of cars. So we slowly increase the number of cars visiting the site every day. And on the y-axis, you have the lifetime of the transformer. So when you have you know, 50 cars charging there every day, this is a 225 AVA transformer, but you're at the maximum lifetime, there's no impact. And you add and add and add cars. And then here, this blue was uncontrolled charging. And so there you see quickly after about 130 cars, suddenly you're really starting to impact the transformer and cause aging and the lifetime really drops off. These different controls are better and better and better. Um, here in orange is the case where we minimize directly for the transformer's lifetime. Uh, it does the best, which is good because you know we're, this was the objective. Um, and I'd like to note also that you can actually get much further. So you can have more than 67% more cars charging there before you have any impact on the transformer just from adding this control. But the really exciting result was these other series that are on top of it. So we have peak minimization and PG&E's E19. And basically what this says is if you have a demand charge in your bill, you're encouraging this peak minimization, you're almost doing as well for the transformer as if you were explicitly making everyone optimize for the transformer's health. So our conclusion from this work was that sites where the transformer is overloaded or at risk of being overloaded, it's good to have this charge and encourage you know, when people are minimizing for their bill, which is what they're most likely to do, they'll also be protecting the equipment. Um, this work sort of showed how powerful control can be. Um, and the next step in this modeling was to try to include that in these large scale modeling tools. It turns out to be really challenging because it's very expensive. So this optimization on the scale of a few hundred cars is fine. 
But when you scale up to millions of cars, it doesn't scale very well at all. And you could take hours or days to run the full optimization problem. So a lot of other large scale models will do with different types of control and simplify the problem to represent it. Um, either doing like a fully centralized model, uh, just modeling sort of choices instead of doing this type of load modulation and doing sort of theoretical approximations. And so in this study, we proposed a new method to learn this directly from data. How do we represent this at scale? This was based on a couple of key insights. The first was that although there's lots of variation day by day for individual drivers, the aggregate load at a given site is pretty consistent. And once you do control, it's still pretty consistent. And so we thought we could just learn this mapping directly, build a big data set of uncontrolled and controlled pairs of profiles, and then forget the optimization and just replace it with machine learning, a very sort of Stanford approach. Um, and so it, it worked pretty well. So we looked at several different rate structures, uh, some with demand charges, some with just energy charges, some with both of them. Uh, I don't think I have time to talk too much about the different rates. But briefly, the methodology looked at uh, building training data sets, so building a big data set of controlled and uncontrolled profiles, dividing it up, tested a bunch of different regression models. Um, and we found that for each different rate schedule, it was either bridge regression or random forest regression that performed the best. Um, and the normalized RMSE was actually pretty good. And so when we look, for example, here are some profiles. This is uncontrolled charging and then min peak, peak minimization control. And you can see there's like a small error between the model and the actual data, but it performs pretty well. And the test set normalized errors are like 2.5% to 4.6%. So then we can use this and plug it into our tool. So this was an uncontrolled scenario I showed earlier. We ran this method and trained a model for peak minimization control. And then once you've trained it, it just becomes like another knob to play with when you're doing the scenario designs. So you say, okay, this is my mixture of driver groups and this is the behaviors. Oh, and I'm doing control. And you can just include that. And it takes less than a second to apply once you find the mapping. Uh, we also looked at when we created a time of use rate based on uh, average grid emissions and learned a model of it put it into the uh, simulation and this is the result. So you can very quickly then just include control as one tool here. And yeah, so before- Did that, oh, did sorry. that just shift the uh, workplace? Yeah, this is just on workplace. So usually like looking at rate schedule based control, different rates apply to different segments. Mm -hmm. So you have like commercial rates like PG&E's E19, and then you'd have residential rates like the one that causes the timer. Um, and they're quite separate in practice. Mm -hmm. well, just won't the four right one kind of uh, kill, kill you in terms of the transformer the in the Yeah, it's really interesting. So this is, uh, I guess I can tell you a secret because the paper is not published yet, but we've been studying this question um, and it is, it, it does increase the peak. So on days when you have a lot of solar, this is the type of control you want to do to align better with that solar. But at the local level, it does damage the transformer. And also, on if you have this sort of rate schedule design control, it encourages you to do the same thing every day. And some days, there's very little solar. And then you're just really increasing your peak at that time. Um, so it's a really interesting research question. Uh, if you want to go into it, there's a lot involved in this rate design. Um, I think it's an interesting conflict because you know it costs a lot of money to upgrade the transformer, but you're also at a large scale trying to align better with solar and transition the grid. And so there's some analysis to be done of the trade-off and sort of which cost is worth it. Maybe the answer is not the same across every site. Um, and some places can afford to upgrade the transformer to better align with solar and other places it's better to protect the equipment. I don't know, but it's a very interesting research direction. Yeah. Shiva, is there a possibility of using like the cost still associated with the transformer and then like trying to minimize the cost and also the time of use? Yeah, you could definitely do that. So in this study, 
the transformer study, we did look at that. Um, and we were going to have sort of this mixed objective where your objective has the cost of the transformer and the build, but then we found that they aligned and there was no trade off because if you're minimizing for the bill in this case, you're also protecting the transformer. Mm -hmm. But if you look at a different objective, like sort of, you know, maybe grid emissions and you're trying to align with solar, then you would have a conflict. And so you could do that type of optimization. I think it's really interesting as a direction because most great design doesn't happen that way. <laughs> um, but it would be great to know, you know, what is the best rate and how do these other rates compare against that benchmark? We don't have the emission embedded in the rates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I have this noted in future work. Um, really quickly, some conclusions are that behavior is really interesting and heterogeneous and important to include in this type of modeling. Um, control is also really powerful and reshapes demand completely when it's applied. It has a really big impact on the profile. And then there's value to having these open source data driven modeling tools, uh, both to improve the models and not have to depend so heavily on assumptions, but also to make this accessible so other people can uh, apply it to their own setting or change the assumptions. But there's a ton of future work. So I mentioned this study of large scale grid impact is coming out soon. But then in terms of the modeling, there's a lot of interesting extensions. You know, we looked at sort of a typical future day, but what about interday variability? This cuts both ways, I think. It's sort of on some days, maybe everyone needs to charge just a long weekend. What does that mean? But on other days, you know, maybe the grid is going to have a hard day tomorrow and you can ask people to wait an extra day because people don't need to charge all the time. There's lots of sort of flexibility that way, I think, that's unexplored. Um, looking at other places I mentioned, future adopters, modeling them differently, looking at other segments. Um, there's room to apply this type of model in medium and heavy duty. I know that's something that is going to be pursued here in the next couple of years. Looking at how this, we only look sort of at time, but there's also a spatial aspect I was talking about with Chinu earlier. Like if you have these charging patterns and you're shifting people's decisions, what does that mean in terms of like a network of charging stations? Um, looking at B2G, I know Mian probably mentioned there is a really big announcement about this just earlier this year of support for new research in B2G and B2X and B2Home. Um, more of this sort of rate design question, what is the best rate? What does it mean to have this conflict between distribution grid and generation level impacts? Climate resilience of charging networks, I think also very unrelated to what I've done so far, but it should be tied in. I mean, I think that will be more and more important. Basically, there's a ton of future work and I'm graduating and really sad that I won't be able to do all of it while I'm here. And so if you have any interests or any questions or want to get started looking at any of these things, I'd be more than happy to talk about it. Um, I think I should stop talking now because I only have three minutes left if you have more questions. Yeah. Um, is there any reason why, in, in, I'm guessing it's just because, that's my own question. It's just because right now EVs have the most storage of anything, but is there any reason that it's EVs in particular versus all residential energy storage? Because what's the difference between a battery and a car and a Tesla Powerwall? It's a great question. I think I think the value of just having the EVs is that you like you already have them or you will already have them. And so if you could all sort of have them do double duty and also I'm sort saying of just for the modeling. Oh, for the modeling. Um, why did I only look at EVs? Yeah. Oh, because it's a lot of work. <laughs> I think you could do a whole PhD on, you know, EVs plus home storage. Yeah. yeah. But I think if you look more closely, so I focused a lot on workplace charging, but I think if you looked more at the home area as well, there's a lot of other research going on here about all the different loads in your home and how do you manage that? There's actually, I don't know if you talked about the lab, there's a lab here on the third floor that has some power walls and there's you know connections to EV charging stations and solar and sort of looking at how to manage the home as a whole load. Um, that would definitely be really cool to tie in here. And so that would just change 
I guess it would change this. This is only showing the EV load, but also if you imagine this overlaying on like all other baseline demand, you're changing both of those, and that could be really interesting. And it's a lot of flexibility too. Yeah, and pay attention to the title, which is just customer behavior, right? And it is easy to analyze. It's difficult to analyze the customer behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the same thing. The transition the energy from the B2B to B2C. When you have the customer involved plus energy, the so last interesting things can be analyzed. And then the other thing that I guess I just observed from like that peak that you were showing, whether this be residential or you know, with the transformer and just the way the grid is set up, if we were to be like on all solar, I feel like if we're maximizing these transformers and like residential energy storage or whatever energy storage, if, if we have all of their energy, even if we store it all, are we like taxing our transformers if we're getting it all at once? Or how would that work? You probably haven't looked at that point. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. One thing I would add to sort of this thought experiment is what if you had that solar co-located with the chargers? So we didn't look at that. We looked at you know a site and you have the EVs and then the transformer. But at the Stanford Bus Center, for example, the buses and a big solar array are behind the same transformer. So then if you looked at that, it would change that problem a lot because if you're just doing EVs behind the transformer, well, I guess basically what we found is you want the load behind the transformer to be very flat. And if you just have EVs, you know, this is the best you can do. But if you also have solar, maybe this is the best you can do because then the total load behind the transformer would be flatter if you align better with solar. Um, yeah, I think it maybe that's the answer then is like save your distribution grid by putting solar wherever you have EVs, but that only works with daytime charging, right? If you put solar on a new home and you have home charging, they don't line up and they don't really help each other. I don't know. Yeah, I, I just say that because there's well, you know, big debate on whether there should be like localized residential energy storage on a very small scale or like huge governmental mm -hmm. batteries sitting in places. Yeah, it's an interesting <clears throat> question. So in this new study, we found that these scenarios with high peak, I mentioned some days there's less solar. And so this is actually just increasing peak net demand. It drives a higher need for grid storage. Um, and if everyone, like if the grid storage and the charging infrastructure and everything were owned and operated by the same body, it would be really easy to evaluate sort of, is it worth it to do this type of control and how much does it cost to have that storage? But when the storage is distributed and all of these decisions are distributed, I think the problem is a lot more complicated too. That's not to say it's better or worse from any other perspective, just it's really interesting to think about how sort of how many people are involved. And when we study this, you know, high level bird's eye view, 2038 million driver impact, it's not very simple to think about, I guess, how you would change that and how you would implement different controls. And is it worth it to have storage in that? Because it's all sorts of different people who are involved in each piece of that. Um, yeah, I don't have, that's not a good answer, but it's a very interesting thing to look into. Yeah. Um, was this, you, you showed the control algorithm that you used, was that actually piloted at the facility? Yeah, so uh, they do controls. Um, Cause I'm just, I guess what I was curious about is- Like these uh, are like a... Like this? Yeah, was that, was that, was this like fully simulated or was this also like piloted and, and the data was collected as well uh, from the facility when you did this? So some of it, so the project was affected by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so it was part of a demonstration project. And so there is control happening at some of the sites at Google, and there is control happening at the sites at Slack, but we didn't actually get to test this like transformer control mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. of sort of the timeline of the testing ended up, we we're gonna start shortly after everything shut down and still no one's, Going to Google and they don't have any workplace charging scan anymore. No. So <laughs> it changed the project a lot. But there is, so for example, at Slack, we installed a temperature sensor inside one of the transformers there so that we could collect more data. I think, for example, this model of 
uh, the temperature. It's very old, um, but it's really, really hard to get the parameters that you need to fill it in. It's like on the nameplate of the transformer, you have some values and you make some assumptions and sort of do the best model you can. But one of the reasons for installing this sensor was to learn how bad the model is and learn how to calibrate it better. So I think that's also an interesting direction that they might continue like testing the transformer and using those temperature sensors to do some sort of experimental validation of it. Um, I think that Slack wouldn't let you overload the transformer to the point of breaking it. Um, so this part might be always a simulation exercise, um, but at least using the real data to tune the model better and understand that I think is definitely a good direction. How would you also like e e bounce noise from people who sort of say charge for an hour and then unplug the car and go somewhere else? Sorry, what was the first? How do you like remove noise for like people who say, for instance, will plug in their car for an hour and then have to leave and go for a meeting or something? But is that noise, or is it just sort of part of how people are using those charging stations? I think those are the types of sessions that aren't included when you have a very sort of modeler based approach, but when you use the data, we do have a lot of sessions like that. And I think it's valuable to capture those and sort of see that this is sort of the messy truth of how people are charging at work. Yeah. And then how do you optimize for for that? Because right? you're not gonna ask like someone's gonna plug in the coin and be like, how long will you here for put in your know, approximate hours? So how do you optimize for how long you feed them charge versus another place? Can you imagine I expect my car to be charged to 20% and I should it was to 10 because they are for instance. Yeah, so that is another aspect of it, this sort of online control versus the control where you know everything in advance. Um, we didn't look at that in the study. Actually, at Slack, one of the sites is with PowerFlex chargers, and they do ask that. So when you arrive, you say, I want to leave, you know, I need 30 miles of charging today, and I'm leaving at 5 p.m. There's a lot of behavioral problems with that. Like people just always say the same amount and ask for more energy than they can receive and like don't have any idea about their state of charge and it ends up being very flawed but there are efforts to do that and collect that type of information um yeah i think we still have some way to go i don't think people think about this very much which is probably beneficial because then you can do control and do all this you know very beneficial you, you know, take advantage of the flexibility for the grid, and they don't care. They don't like even know or think about it. Mm -hmm. But if you then need to get information from the drivers about, you know, what's your state of charge or how much energy do you need today, they don't know. I mm -hmm. can't answer that either. So yeah. that's one of the challenges. Yeah. So the button says most cheapest and most often. <laughs> <laughs> You don't care how much you have, yeah, or one that's more expensive, but get what you want. <laughs> yeah. If you know what you want. Yeah, but you, if you have to work harder for the more expensive, less efficient one, people won't get it. So it's always get the cheap. Yeah. I think the app also has like a history, and so you can just like say, oh, what I put last time. I probably shouldn't have. <laughs> There's one. Question the chat. Oh, I think we can probably wrap up for in person. Okay. Unless it's super quick to answer. Oh, yeah. Um, so there's a question in the chat, and then there's two. Oh, the one in the QA. Um, does the ML approach generate individual optimized charging control sequence or the stage driven approach is used for the estimation of only? Uh, I'm not sure individual optimized charging control sequence. Um, it's only looking at the aggregate. So for example, there are many other ML-based approaches that look at individual sessions and say, okay, this driver came at this time every day and we learn from their habits and then we learn, you know, we can predict that tomorrow they'll arrive at nine. That's a different approach. This is just looking Really, we want to understand the shape change from uncontrolled to controlled in the aggregate. So once you train this, how we run it is in, you know, in this model, we generate an uncontrolled profile 
and we just apply the mapping. And so what it generates is the corresponding control profile as an estimate. Um, yeah, nothing individual, only sort of at the scientific level. Great. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.